Hi, everyone, and welcome to Night School. I'm Lynn from the Nightlife Programming Team. And I'm Christina, the event producer. Thanks for tuning in. Tonight, we are going back 4.6 billion years. We'll walk you through baby Earth, becoming Mother Earth, the Ice Age, and how to bring prehistoric creatures to life. We'll begin with the Academy's own Marcella Barca, the curatorial assistant for our wonderful geology collections, who's going to give us a rapid history lesson of the Earth and the solar system. Um, up next is Nick Spano, a recent PhD grad from the UC Berkeley Museum of Paleontology, and he'll pick up with the Ice Age and super light talk about mass extinctions, global warming, societal change, and what it means for our future. And finally, learn about the making of paleo art. It's not just dinosaurs, uh, with illustrator Franz Anthony, who's joining us all the way from Indonesia, where it's Friday morning, to talk about fossil cephalopods. And as always, tonight's program is live. So say hi, let us know where you're watching from, and share any comments or questions in the chat. We'll have a Q&A session with Maricela and Nick midway through, and another one at the end with Franz. So be sure to get your questions in and stay tuned. Um, and let's get started with Marcel. Hey everybody, thank you to Christina and Lynn for organizing this. It was always really fun to be able to table specimens at nightlife in person with you all, but I guess this will have to do for now the next best thing. And my goal for tonight is to walk you through um, 4.6 billion year history of this earth from this lovely depiction of the solar nebula to what it is now. And this is kind of what it feels like right now, right? But hopefully by the end, I'll convince you maybe with a side of existentialism or um, yeah, just general questioning of life that still life is beautiful and it's unique that we're all here right now in this pandemic in 2020, um, but that's okay. So hold on to your butts, uh, the great words of Samuel Jackson, Jurassic Park, because we're going to do 4.6 billion years in 25 minutes. This is just like a greatest hits compilation of uh, things through my perspective that are important um, in the geologic record. So the universe at 13 billion years old, humans on the other end, two million years old, uh, basically babies. And two things that are missing from this greatest hits list are sexual reproduction and the appearance of animals. So you could probably take a second and just think about what came first. Um, and if you guessed that sexual reproduction was 1.2 billion years old, good job. If you didn't, that's okay, because I'm gonna come back to this a couple more times throughout the presentation. Uh, I like to start out with meteorites, just because they're like these concrete, tangible things that people can interact with and see, and they're really old. Um, they may not give you like a scale as to how old 4.5 billion years is, or what the net worth of Jeff Bezos is, but these are like tangible things. And these specimens are from the collections at the Academy. To the left is one of my favorite specimens. It's a palisite. And it has these really beautiful olivine crystals and they're really rare and they're really sought after. And on the next slide, we have these ordinary chondrites, a kind of stone meteorite that's really common and they may not be as beautiful as a palisite, but they're definitely really cool in that they have these little silicate grains in them called chondrules, and you can see them outlined in the image. And these little grains were present in the solar nebula. Um, so they just remained unchanged in the specimen, flew through space and ended up on earth. And now it's here in some collection. Um, I'm, I don't remember from where, but it's um, just like a, like a really unique glimpse into that time in geologic history. Piggybacking off of that, this is a representation of um, the protoplanetary disk, which is basically a pancake 
of swirling cosmic dust and somewhere in this dust was the baby earth. It had a really violent um, coming up. <laughs> there was lots of collisions, lots of getting thrown around. Um, if you can imagine rolling a ball of Play-Doh on the carpet, you're gonna pick up a lot of really random things. In this case, the random things are cosmic dust. And we know that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old because of a really um, rad technique called radiometric dating. And you can use it on zircon. So part of the crystal structure of these um, zircon minerals is uranium. And you can use the half-life of uranium to get the age of the Earth. And I'm sure it's a technique that Aristotle and geologists in the 19th century would have drilled over. Right, so um, Earth became a mother sometime around 3.5 billion years ago. And its first poster child uh, were the stromatolites. There was Earth before, there was life on Earth before the stromatolites, probably bacteria, but um, these stromatolites are the first like undisputed fossil evidence of life on Earth. And if you don't know what that is, it's okay. They're just photos photosynthesizing bacteria that are um, pulling carbon dioxide out of the water, out of the atmosphere, and generating oxygen. So this specimen from the collection might not look like much, but don't judge a book by its cover because without it, we wouldn't be the oxygen um, consuming life forms that we are today without them. And they're still around today in Western Australia. They're really rare now though. Um, and they're only found in shallow waters. So pour one out for stromatolites and also shout out to Australia. Um, aside from having tons of animals that will kill you and are really terrifying, um, it's also home to a lot of really cool geologic formations like stromatolites and like the zircon that dated the earth back to 4.5 billion years. Right, so stromatolite is a fossil and usually at nightlife it's kind of fun to talk to people about what a fossil is. And it's not just dinosaurs, they're really familiar. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Um, there are definitely other kinds of fossils. And basically what it boils down to is a fossil is anything of evidence of past life on earth. And what you're looking at now is um, what we call chemical fossil. And the specific type is a carrageen, which is just, um, Fancy word for a bunch of carbon and hydrogen that's linked together. And carbon and hydrogen linked together is like a really telltale signature of previous life. And it's usually plants. In this case, it's um, in a piece of wood. And these were taken with a scanning electron microscope. And oil geologists really fawn over carrageen because it's a precursor to fossil fuel deposits. Right. So other really tiny fossils that you need a microscope to look at are the microfossils. Um, to the far left is a strew of diatoms. So somebody just spread them out on a microscope slide, slide in the 1900s, and I took this photo of them a couple of years ago. And if you're really bored in the Victorian era, a really popular thing to do was arrange them on slides and make these little artistic patterns. And this um, collection is also, uh, there's like a little collection of artistically arranged diatoms in our collections at the Academy as well. And if you don't know what a diatom is, it's basically the modern analog of what a stromatolite um, was they they're the primary producers in marine environments now um, they generate a lot of oxygen um, so to the right of the arranged diatom slide is a microscope photo that I took of radiolarians um, also another 
kind of little microfossil with really cool structures. And then to the right of that are um, well slides. And you might be able to make out like these really tiny um, grain of sand looking things in the middle of the wells. And um, in there are these little other microfossils called forams. And we actually have a grant from the National Science Foundation right now to like digitize this collection of forams in order um, to reconstruct like paleoclimates. Right. So next up on what is a fossil, we have amber um, of Jurassic Park fame. Amber is really cool. It's really pretty. Everybody loves it. It's really sexy, but it's also, um, they can tell really cool stories. So the amber specimen on the left is of an asterid flower. And if you don't know what an asterid flower is, you can thank it for things like coffee, potatoes, tomatoes, sunflowers. It's this really big family of flowering plants. And this specimen was trapped in amber 20 million years ago, and it's the first asteroid flower fossil that's been found. And it's in our collections at the Academy. And it was described by a man named George Pointer, who is like the Elvis of studying stuff trapped in amber. And it was through him that Michael Crichton got the idea um, that you could extract um, dinosaur DNA out of the stuff. Um, trapped in amber. Um, since been disproved, but like that's where we got the idea. And next to that is a little piece of amber also in our collection. And it, there's a wasp in the middle. And from the photo, you can't really tell, you can't really make out a lot of the detail. Um, but this is a CT scan that I did of this piece of amber a couple of years ago. And it's this really cool piece of technology that we have now, and it allows you to like do measurements on what's trapped inside the amber and like study its anatomy without um, destroying the specimen. Right. So other kinds of fossils, um, we went over like body fossils. This is more characteristic of trace fossils. So things like footprints, things like worm burrows. Um, just signs of life. And these are from a place called Dino Ridge just out of Denver, back in the Cretaceous when Denver um, had a coastline because of the Western Interior Seaway. Right. And uh, these are more fossils, believe it or not. And you can probably say, Marcella, I don't believe you. They just look like rocks. And I wouldn't blame you because they do just look like rocks. But the one on the left is a coprolite, which is a fancy word for fossilized poop. And the ones on the right are examples of gastroliths, um, gastro from stomach. And if you still don't believe me and you're like, no, those are just smooth rocks, like I'm, I'm sure of it, you're a crazy person, I would show you this really special fossil where the gastroliths were actually um, found inside the body cavity. And they're found there because birds and reptiles would swallow these rocks to aid in digestion. Right, so that was in no means like an exhaustive list of kinds of fossils. I could probably do like a whole hour on just kinds of fossils by themselves, but we're going to change gears a little bit and kind of explore how humans have broken up geologic time. And we're going to start from the beginning in the Precambrian. This skinny yellow column represents 80% of Earth's history, 4 billion years. There wasn't a lot going on in terms of life on Earth at this time, but there was a lot of important um, stage setting processes that occurred. And it began looking like on the left, really scary, terrifying, molten lava situation. Um, some scientists estimate that there were 22,000 meteorite impacts during this time, 
when the Earth was spinning around in that protoplanetary disk after the nebula. And it was probably one of those impacts that gave us the moon. Um, but by the end of the Precambrian, everything kind of chilled out. Um, the Earth cooled off. You got the formation of oceans, the beginning of plate tectonics. And the stromatolites, you can kind of like make out little stromatolite, stromatolite reefs on the right. And I promise we would come back to sexual reproduction. Somewhere in these um, waters is red algae. And red algae, we know, um, um, <laughs> reproduces sexually. So um, this is, it's a depiction of like of sexual reproduction 1.2 billion years ago. And at the end of the Precambrian, uh, this is kind of what life forms were working with in terms of land mass. And it was the home for the Ediacaran biota. Um, biota in quotes because we're actually not really sure what some of these were, if they were plants or animals or their own like kingdom of life. Um, but they're, they're these forms that keep occurring also in Australia. So Australia has always been weird. It was weird back then. It's weird now. And this lovely phallic sculpture is an artistic representation of the images to the right which were published by Mary Drozer at UC Riverside. And just like staying on the sexual reproduction train, um, uh, she successfully argued in that paper that they also um, underwent sexual reproduction. So it's like the first accepted evidence of sexual reproduction in animals about 600 million years ago. Right, so now we're going into the Paleozoic, and the Paleozoic is kind of like a very romantic geologic era to me because it's bookended by two really major, totally opposite phenomenon. Um, it kicked off with the Cambrian explosion, this really vast explosion of life on Earth, different life forms. And it ended with the biggest mass extinction in Earth's history, where over 90% of species um, just said goodnight forever. So yeah, towards the end of the Paleozoic, we had our friend Pangea. To the right is uh, an artistic depiction of a Paleozoic ocean. Um, let me see if I can... I don't know if you can see the pointer, but this is a fossil of Anomalycaris, a little shrimp looking thing. And this is the drawing of Anomalycaris. And if you were Anomalycaris in the Paleozoic Ocean, like you were the apex predator, you got to like mob around in this like pink tutu thing, but you were it, everybody was scared of you and you were like the first kind of predator on the scene. Um, and if you were a trilobite, you were just a bottom feeder. <laughs> They're basically the cockroaches of the ocean. <laughs> uh, so other things that were kicking around in the Paleozoic um, to the right are plant fossils. So I didn't even mention plant fossils in those other slides, but we have a fern and then a large cycad seed on the bottom right. And cycads are still around today as well, but they're endangered. And the really horrifying thing on the left is Dunkleosteus, which was a really crazy looking armored fish. And um, there's actually fossils of Dunkleosteus ancestors that have embryos in them. So that was actually um, evidence for internal insemination in vertebrates, like the first, ev first evidence of that. And also towards the end of the Paleozoic, we have Tiktaalik, um, made famous by Neil Shubin, who discovered it in Arctic Canada. 
Um, he did a PBS series called Your Inner Fish, which is a way more thorough and informed <laughs> history of life on Earth, and I would highly recommend it. And if you know me in real life, I like live for memes, so <laughs> especially um, science memes. So these are just some I found of Tiktaalik. And it's basically um, like a transitional fossil between fish and tetrapods. So things like amphibians that kind of paved the way for reptiles, mammals, and then later us. Okay, so leaving behind the Primo Triassic mass extinction, we start to move into the Mesozoic. Um, yeah, Pangaea broke up in the Mesozoic. The continents are kind of taking on a formation that's more familiar to us. The climate is really different. And we all know that dinosaurs are around in the Mesozoic. And like I said earlier, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on dinosaurs because uh, they get all the attention, but I will say, and I'll just be like a total wet blanket, stick in the mud, and say that Littlefoot and Spike weren't even alive when everybody else was, and they actually went extinct before the rest of the dinosaurs in Land Before Time, so sorry to like crush childhood dreams, um, but aside from that, on a like more on a brighter note, to the right is a specimen of California's state dinosaur, which is a hadrosaur, the duckbills that have these really awesome crests. And this specimen has skin preserved with it as well. Um, yeah, so those are pretty cool. I'll give props to that dinosaur. Okay, so in the Mesozoic, Aside from dinosaurs, there were lots of other cool things going on and including um, marine reptiles. This fossil is of an ichthyosaur it was found in Germany and you can see it um, giving birth. So this mother ichthyosaur uh, was giving birth while it died and you can see the little baby coming out. Um, and this image is from a publication that I got. It's down there on the right. Um, yeah, it was just another live birth. So there's actually, there's one coming out and then there's other ones that are trapped in the pelvis that you can see in a different part of the image. So ichthyosaurs are marine reptiles that lived in the Mesozoic. Um, and I like, I like to think about the Mesozoic being all about the marine reptiles. There are really scary things going on in the Mesozoic Ocean. Uh, really terrifying predators, very large, lots of teeth, really scary. And it's, uh, it kind of, it sparked this thing called escalation where these predators are getting really big and scary. So prey have to develop these new ways and structures for protecting themselves from being eaten. <clears throat> and you can see this in um, ammonites. So ammonites, which I think Franz might talk about later, um, were basically shelled octopuses, if you can imagine that. And everybody always asks, like, where are all the dinosaurs from California? And the answer is that California was actually mostly underwater in the Mesozoic slash undergoing really violent mountain building in the Mesozoic. So a lot of fossils from California are marine. And you can see that um, example of like escalation in the specimen on the right, because toward, towards the end of um, ammonite lineages, they started like getting these crazy spikes on their shells and opening up their coils which is supposed to be like an anti-predatory mechanism. Okay, so at the end of the Mesozoic, the dinosaurs all went extinct and we get the Cenozoic and that's where we are now. And it's really short, <laughs> it's only 65 million years long so far. Um, and there's a really cool exhibit at the Hayden Planetarium in New York City where you like walk a hundred yards and every step is 70 million years. So if you take one step 
in that exhibit. Like you'll miss the Cenozoic entirely if you blink an eye, like that's it. Um, uh, yeah, so here um, in this, you can kind of see, this is what it looked like um, after the extinction of the white cat, the dinosaurs, and this is where the impact struck that wiped them out. And like I said, California was mostly underwater in the Mesozoic, and it was still becoming California as we know it today in the Cenozoic up until like 40-ish million years ago. Bakersfield was a beach, if you can believe that. I probably still wouldn't believe that if we didn't have fossils in the collection of like oysters from Fresno um, because it was all underwater. And also during this time, Wyoming was like a subtropical forest. So we had a North American primate that went extinct and there were palm trees in Alaska. It was very different. Um, but we also have like the darlings of the Cenozoic, which are the Ice Age megafauna. Everybody loves them. I love them. I have a personal bias towards them, uh, but I'm not gonna steal Nick's thunder because he's gonna talk about them. But I just want to point out like how short um, their lifespan was on Earth. It's just like this outline of the black box in the timeline. Um, and yeah, Nick's going to talk about this too, but their extinction um, was largely due to uh, hunting by humans, but also climate change. So humans didn't ruin everything this time, just some of it. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you so far that the history of life is history of change. There's a lot of, we've seen a lot of extinction, we've seen a lot of turnover of species, which you can see in this graph to the left. It just shows the five mass extinction, five mass extinctions and these turnover of genera. But what we do at the academy is use um, these fossils in the collection that we have and collections from all over the world to kind of like see what the connections were in ecosystems in the past. And it actually turns out that depending on the scale that you look at these things, communities can be really stable through time and really rapid changes in the ecosystem um, destabilizes communities. And um, it can be kind of important to look at these communities in the past and maybe like forecast or come up with strategic ways to save ecosystems in the future because yeah, thing like communities in the past have been subject to climate change and really extreme events and thanks to humans, it's kind of like what's happening now just at a really fast, um, on a really fast time scale. And to the right is just a photo of the people in my department who are curating your fossils and this was like the last time we were all allowed to be together and take a photo. Um, yeah, and I'll be around after Nick's talk if anybody has any questions about any of this stuff. <laughs> You're live. Okay. All right. Oops. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. Hello. Okay. All right. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. Uh, thank you to Maricela for that presentation. Uh, I don't know Jeff Bezos's net worth either, but I did really enjoy your talk. So let's get started. I am Nick. I'm a recent grad from the UC Museum of Paleontology, a focus on Ice Age paleontology and its connections to life today. And I really like Ice Age paleontology because one, it is cool, but two, it is relatively recent in Earth's history, which means a lot of stuff is still around. And three, that's around the same time we see a lot of human activities really picking up. 
I've volunteered at nightlife events showing Ice Age fossils in the past, so I'm excited to digitally be here for tonight. And I'm happy to share these slides with references if anyone's interested after the talk. So let's see. Okay. All right. If you were to read the news today, this is from October 12th, a little bit ago. There was a story in Reuters about climate change and its profound threat to global growth. Here's a map showing temperature change over the past 50 years, and almost everywhere is getting warmer. The World Wildlife Fund back in September came out with a, their Living Planet Report showing that animal populations worldwide have declined nearly 70% in the past half century. To show that in action, here is a gif of an orangutan in a recently cut down Indonesian forest and an excavator that it's swinging onto, kind of a real life Lorax story happening right now. And just stumbled upon this article talking about how in the past 70 years, humans have exceeded the energy consumption of the entire preceding 11,700 years, largely through combustion of fossil fuels. This huge increase in energy consumption has then allowed for a dramatic increase in human population, industrial activity, but also pollution, environmental degradation, and climate change. So a lot is happening to Earth. And to tie this in with tonight's theme, let's go back to the Ice Age and check what the news looked like then. So if you were just hanging out in this field with some woolly mammoths, some horses, maybe some lions, a rhino, and just plop down and start reading the paper, you might find that those stories I was just telling you about were happening in a very similar form during the Ice Age as well. So the theme that I want to get across tonight is this idea that the past is prologue. And for those of you who listen to electronic music, you may be familiar with this as a Tycho album. But what I mean by that is what has happened in Earth's history has set the foundations for what's happening now with very important implications for the future. Tying in with Monticello's talk, here's a figure showing Earth's temperature over the past 541 million years. It's color coded by age compared to the 1960 to 1990 global average temperature. That's a black horizontal line running a little below the middle. On the y-axis, we have degrees Celsius on the left. Same thing in Fahrenheit on the right. Note the shift though in time scales on the x-axis. We have 100 million tick year tick marks on the most left, 10 million year tick marks below the green wiggle, 1 million year tick marks under the black wiggle, 200,000 year tick marks for the pinkish red wiggle, and then 5,000 year tick marks on the right end. Things have been getting generally cooler, as we can see throughout the Cenozoic over the past 65 million years of Earth's history. To get at causes of that, here is a map showing tectonic change throughout the Cenozoic. MA means millions of years ago. And starting in the Oligocene, and once this gift loops back again, you'll see it a little bit better. You'll see India slamming into Asia, as it's doing right now. And that caused the uplift of the Himalayas, which cools the rest of the planet by reflecting more sunlight with ice. And into the Pliocene here, that's when Panama forms this isthmus connecting North and South America. That's going to block oceanic currents that would bring warm equatorial water, water between North and South America northward. And that's going to start Arctic glacier formation and progressive cooling to the Arctic ice sheet and more cooling from the Pliocene into the Pleistocene is going to lead to the Ice Age as we know it. So you can also see on this graph a lot of wiggles going up and down, up and down, up and down throughout the Cenozoic. What's causing those wiggles for the most part is variations in Earth's orbit, that is changes from a more circular orbit to a more elliptical orbit, changes in how Earth's axis is tilted relative to the sun. So let's say my fist is the sun, here's Earth's axis, sometimes a little closer, sometimes a little further away, if you're in the Northern hemisphere that is. And just like a spinning top, Earth rotates through time. And so if you match the frequencies of those variations with these wiggles in temperature through time, they line up pretty well. It's been happening all throughout the Cenozoic, but it wasn't until the Pleistocene 
that is about two and a half million years ago to 11,700 years ago that they had much of an effect. The quaternary here, that box is going to be what I'm talking about most of today. And that is the age of really big Ice Age mammals, the ones that everyone loves. This is uh, the most recent coldest time is going to be what's called the LGM, or that's the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago. And afterwards, we get into what's called the Holocene, which is the past about 12,000 years of Earth's history, where agriculture and civilization started taking off, and climate, as you can see here, has been quite stable. Some general takeaways we can get from this graph right off the bat is, yes, things have been warmer, but if we keep up greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, that is 30 years from now, things will be warmer than they have been in the past 130,000 years and is projected by 2100, 80 years from now, we could be as warm as never in the past about 8 million years. For now, we're still in an icy world, so let's talk about Ice Age mammals. Okay. All right, so here we are in San Francisco. I'm sure a lot of you are tuning in locally. Um, there is the red icon showing where the Cal Academy is. And back when Cal Academy was where Chinatown is now, they had a live woolly mammoth. Not really live, but a woolly mammoth on display. Some interesting other things that have been found near San Francisco include a Colombian mammoth fossil that was uh, found when the Bay Bridge was being built. Here is one tooth. It's about the size of a hand. That is one molar from a mammoth. This is the Colombian mammoth, not a woolly mammoth. So you can see in this restoration, no wool whatsoever. Over right by the San Francisco Zoo, there's been found a tooth about the same size as a Colombian mammoth tooth of a mastodon. And as the Twin Peaks Tunnel was being built, excavators, workers found a giant ground sloth upper arm bone or humerus. Now, no, there are no living giant animals in the Bay Area left. So let's zoom out a little bit and look to the rest of the US, see if we can find other things out there. If we go down south to the heart of LA, we get to the La Brea Tar Pits, very famous for Smilodon, the saber-toothed cat, this California state fossil, and dire wolves, the inspiration for the ones in Game of Thrones. But Bones aren't the other, the only things that we find as fossils. If we go 15 miles east of Las Vegas, we find Gypsum Cave, which has 13,000 year old fur from the Shasta ground sloth, which is an interesting reddish color. If we cut north to Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, people in 1979 who were looking for gold and permafrost found an entire mummified bison. It's not a modern bison though. Looking at the horns, they're much bigger than those of modern bison. This is what's called the Step bison. S-T-E-P-P-E, -P -P -E. step is another word for grassland, and radiocarbon dating of its skin found it to be about 36,000 years old. Interestingly, it also has claw marks from an American lion, suggesting that that's what that is what did it in. American lions were just like African lions, about 30% bigger though, and bones of African, or excuse me, American lions can also be found at La Brea and around the Bay Area. If we head out east, there were fossilized claws found in a Kentucky cave in 1797. They were sent to the avid naturalist and our third US president, Thomas Jefferson. And he wondered, are those lion claws? Are they still alive out west? Are there other large animals still alive out west? So in 1804, a year after the Louisiana Purchase, Jefferson asked his personal secretary, Mary Weather Lewis, to stop by this cave and collect more fossils on his way to meet up with his friend, William Clark, as they proceeded to find a commerce route to the Pacific. And they kept their eyes peeled for big animals. This was the first presidential fitness test. Just kidding. Um, this was important, not as a presidential fitness test, because a famous French naturalist named Count Buffon popularized the idea that at the time, animals in the Americas were degenerate, the meaning shriveled and diminished compared to those across the Atlantic. So national pride was at stake and extinction wasn't established as a scientific theory yet. So people didn't know if these things were alive really or not. That is people who were relatively new to the continent. 
They didn't find any saber tooth cats or American lions or anything else like that living. They're about 12,000 years too late for that, but lots of bones were collected along Lewis and Clark's trip and sent back to the White House. The claws that were sent to Jefferson, those were of a giant ground sloth called Megalonyx. And the species of that giant ground sloth is now called Megalonyx jeffersonii. So what did Ice Age animals look like back in Europe then? Okay, one of the best ways to look at Europe's Ice Age history is through its cave paintings. It's a different paleo art from what Franz will be doing. But if we start with Spain, we have over here, this is the cave of Altamira. And I'll give you a little bit if you want to throw in the comments there, maybe what you think this animal might be. I can't see the comments right now, so I'll just take your word for it. But this is our old friend, the Sep Bison, restoration vet. And over at another cave, getting into France, we have a small statue of a cave lion cub, somewhere between 80 and 10,000 years old. Moving over to Le Co, one of the most famous cave sites in the world. We find this painting of what looks like a stylized reindeer, but it's probably Megaloceros giganteus, the giant deer, which was six and a half feet tall at the shoulders and had a 12 foot wide rack of antlers. You can see one of those racks on display at Cal Academy once things back open, open back up again. And last we have Chavi Cave. Um, and this cave is really, really well preserved because it was sealed at some point uh, by a landslide after um, in 1994, somebody was exploring around there and found a little tiny opening to this cave. And so all the stuff is very well preserved in here. And I'll ask for people who are interested in chiming in on the comments again, what kind of animals they see in this painting. Give them a little bit of time for that. We have on top, those look like bulls. Those are Oroxen. Uh, wolves are to dogs as Oroxen are to cattle. The last known individuals died in 1627 in a forest in Poland. We have, you can see there, some horses, which are Tarpan. The Tarpan was the last European wild horse. Now horses in Europe are all domesticated. And on the bottom there, you can see woolly rhinos. There are also non-woolly rhinos in Europe during the Ice Age. And note the two on the bottom right, with their faces really close together, we know that black rhino males today will sometimes fight with each other. So it's interpreted that this is maybe what the artist was getting at. And if you want to look at more really beautiful, really awesome Ice Age cave art and a whole documentary about it, there is one called The Cave of Forgotten Dreams that I highly recommend checking out. So you can see here, everything is slightly different to the animals that we know really well today but very similar. So now that we've talked about all of these animals, let's talk about us. Here we have a map showing when the first Homo sapiens, sapiens, sapiens or us, arrived on each continent, when significant climate change was occurring, that is the blue boxes there, and when large animals became extinct on each of these continents. The age bracket is shown in the red boxes. All those ages are in thousands of years before present, Animal icons show when large animals on each continent became extinct. The bigger the icon, the more of those animals that became extinct. The number on each animal shows how many genera, or uh, which is a plural genus, became extinct. And the animal colors represent suggested extinction causes, which I'll get to in a bit. Tracing our footsteps here, as we are coming out of Africa, about 10 large animal genera became extinct. Uh, at this time, tool-wise, we only had hand axes, which are cleavers made from rocks. But about 75,000 years ago in South Africa, we see some of the oldest art with some complex geometric engravings on bone, deliberately perforated shells, possibly jewelry here. Then we cross the Red Sea to the Arabian Peninsula and spread across Asia quite quickly. Then we went to Indonesia and Australia followed by a wave of extinctions that happened before significant climate change there. The icon we're seeing here in Australia, that is of a diprotodon, a rhino-sized wombat of the Ice Age. We also 
let's see, got into Europe around this time and invented harpoons for fishing. Here we have a very interesting artifact. This is the top of a spear thrower. It's a decoration on top of it. And I want you to take a guess seeing what you see here, because there are two different things that come out from here. So one of them, at least the first one I saw when I first saw this, is we look at the bulb on top, it's kind of like a head. We got this curve coming down to the left. Those are like tusks. We got maybe a front foot there, back foot there. This is a, this is a mammoth, okay? But then if we look down, right where that first leg is in between the first leg and the tusks, we see maybe what is an eye, and then the tusks become horns. The head becomes a hump over the shoulders, and we see a bull ready to charge. This is the oldest known optical illusion. Very cool. Into Russia, about 50,000 years ago, we find the world's oldest bone needles, which, you know, very tiny, is literally finding a needle in a haystack. And this is very important because finding it in a continental or inland location uh, shows that these people were traveling inland probably because they had these bone needles. Continental winters can be really harsh, so a lot of human populations live by the sea. But if you can sew some pelts or fibers together for clothes, you can travel upstream inland and try to weather it out. Then we went up the coast of East Asia, across another bridge that was present between Russia and Alaska when sea level was much lower during the peak of this glacial event, into North America, around the same time as warming climate and extinctions occurring, and then finally came down into South America, right around the same time that climate was changing. The icon here shows a glyptodon, which was a Volkswagen beetle-sized armadillo. Some takeaway here is, take, excuse me, takeaways here. One, half of all large animal species have become extinct within the past 50,000 years. Geologically speaking, as we just saw, that is the blink of an eye. It seems very coincidental that these extinctions mostly occur right around the same time that we showed up. Could be due to overhunting, could be due to habitat loss. However, we know looking at the past of extinctions, climate change can be a really important cause too. So people have been arguing, bickering back and forth for about the past 60 years about whether climate change given we were coming out from the last glacial maximum into warming for a lot of this was the cause of these extinctions, or maybe hunting of these animals and habitat modification, other human pressures were causing these extinctions. Now we're finally getting to a point where we can ask, well, why not both? And these complex stories are challenging to try to comprehend, but become much more interesting if we can put those pieces together. So now we got a question of what happens next. Here we show a figure of body mass distributions of different animals. We see on the top that is Ice Age and we see things getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Anthropocene here means everything since 1950 going down through time um, into the future that is looking down this figure. And if we keep up these trends in the next 200 years, what do you think the biggest animal on earth is going to be a cow. So that means no more giraffes, no more whales, no more elephants, no more hippos, no more rhinos, none of that. If trends from the ice age continue with what we're doing today. But we decide what happens next. To end my presentation, I'll quote the great science presenter, Carl Sagan, who said, fundamental changes in society are sometimes labeled as contrary to human nature, as if there's only one human nature. We know better, whoops. Prehistoric peoples had no global communications, education, or management systems in place to address these concerns, but we do. So although the past is prologue, it doesn't have to be our destiny. So with that, Thank you so much for your time. 
And Marisela and I will be signing on now for a joint Q&A and are happy to address your questions. Hi, thanks, Nick and Maricela. We have a few questions. Um, so let's get started. Maricela, why do some beings become fossils and others don't? AKA, I, if I wanna become a fossil, what do I do? Right, Maricela, I think you're on mute. Yeah. There okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I actually think Nick and the UCMP crew did a really funny how to become a fossil exhibit at Nightlife <laughs> once. Um, but it is really hard to become a fossil. You have to die in the right place. So somewhere that you're not, you're going to die, get covered in sediment so you don't decompose. Um, you have to die in a place where tectonics aren't going to scatter your bones all over the place. And on top of all of that, you have to be discovered by someone later who cares and knows what they found. Um, yeah, so if you want to become a fossil, best places to die are the bottoms of lakes or just ask someone to throw you in the bottom of a really calm river, lake bed, because um, then the sediment will cover you up and you'll just like be undisturbed for a really long time. Yeah, so... And then hopefully someone will find you. Um, and hopefully somebody will find you. <laughs> yeah. There's really cool deposits in Germany and other places in the world called Lagerstatten, where they preserve like really excellent, really detailed fossils. So you could probably um, get asked to bury, get buried there. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. Nick, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> Nothing I can think of. Um, yeah, the... The first thing that comes to my mind that I would add, if anything, it's kind of a sad note, which is a great place to preserve biological materials is a freezer. And we have a giant outdoor freezer in the Arctic, but that is mm -hmm. rapidly disappearing. So, but that is also why we're seeing <laughs> many more of uh, these ice age fossils coming out from Russia and Canada and Alaska. So cool. So if you want to become a fossil, now you know. Yeah. Um Nick, uh why is everything so big in the ice yes, age? Yes. That is a excellent question and I cut out those slides in the interest of time, but two possible reasons that I'll touch on now. One is this idea of Cope's rule, which was named after paleontologists who made this observation that uh, groups on the tree of life, in particular, he was looking at horses, for example, but it may also hold true for dinosaurs, tend to get bigger through time. And so there are some advantages to being bigger through time. That is, you are much less likely to be bullied around, predated upon. You are much more likely to be a better bully and fight off uh, potential competitors. And you in tough times might be better able to deal with lean conditions. If you have more body mass, you can eat yourself in a way by metabolizing your tissues. But it turns out that might be more of a statistical artifact of people really liking to find big things and finding bigger things. So another reason, especially when it comes to the ice ages, is this idea um, uh, what's called Bergman's rule, which is that because your volume grows at a cubic rate and your surface area or your skin grows at a square rate, a given lineage is going to do much better in colder in colder conditions and is, a, is going to gain volume much more quickly than they'll gain surface area. Uh, and so it'll be much harder to lose heat in colder conditions if you grow bigger. And so it's thought that maybe with a cooling climate overall, that is why things got really, really big. But there are other things like oxygen concentration that go into deeper time that play into it as well. Cool. Um, Maricela, you showed a CT scan of a wasp in amber earlier. Um, what kind of data and stories can that tell you? Um, it can tell you about 
what the setting at that time and place was. So that wasp was found in Baltic amber and the Baltic Sea right now is not the most forested place in the world. I don't think it's really cold. Um, yeah, but since amber is just fossilized tree resin, it tells you a little bit about the environment back then. Um, it can tell you based on what's trapped inside, what kind of animals were living there. Um, there is like a really cool piece of an ammonite trapped in amber that was published in a paper a couple years ago. So it can kind of tell you um, about the ecosystem too, because there can be more than one thing trapped in a piece of amber as well. Um, yeah, and just it. Uh, it can help like fill in the fossil record too of a lot of like soft body things that don't get fossilized as easily. Um, Nick, I'm just going back and forth. Nick, you showed an image earlier of a woolly rhino and we just want to know more. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so woolly rhinos were a, uh, Species of rhino, I think off the top of my head is Celadonta antiquus, um, but they were alive throughout Europe and Asia, in Russia, into Mongolia and China. There was even a woolly rhino that was just excavated and found in some permafrost um, pretty recently too. And they were around um, until about, yeah, 40, 30, somewhere between 40 and 20,000 years ago, I think off the top of my head. And yeah, I thought that just like woolly mammoths, they had a lot of fur. That was a really good adaptation in living in very cold places. It's a really interesting point that woolly rhinos never, there are a lot of things that crossed over from Russia to Alaska when sea level was much lower, but woolly rhinos were not one of those things. And I haven't looked that much into why, but I know that's been a question in paleontology. Uh, there were at least three other species of non-woolly rhino in Europe during what's called the last interglacial about 130,000 years ago, uh, along with woolly rhinos, which is very cool. Cool. Um... I think we have time for one more question. So I'm gonna ask you both this. Uh, what is the most concise thing you can say to someone who is on the fence about the fact of climate change? <laughs> Being concise is not my strength. <laughs> um, but I think I would just try to hammer in the fact that the climate change that we're experiencing now is happening really fast and really rapid. And a lot of people are like, well, the climate's been changing. And I think in both of our presentations, yeah, the, the climate is changing, but now we're, we've just accelerated it so fast that, that that's what's concerning now. And if we don't do anything, we're in a lot of trouble. Slash we're probably already mm -hmm. in a lot of trouble. Right. Yeah. yeah, I would add with that, uh, the importance if it is a situation where you can potentially have a bit more of a conversation with somebody who holds that belief to really just start with the question of not in a rhetorical kind of way, maybe a little bit more tactfully worded, but why do you think that? Why do you believe that? And really get at this question of where they're coming from and where they're getting their information from to really have that conversation with them. And although the, the evidence behind climate change and the human cause nature of it is very solid and sound, to be able to figure out where this person is coming from and really have some dialogue so that they don't feel like you're just shutting them down and, you know, they can go forward in the world really feeling like, oh, this person who knows things about climate change wasn't a jerk to me is really important too, even if you don't say change their mind. Yeah, yeah. good advice. Um, 
I think that's all the time we have for Q&A. Thank you, Maricela and Nick uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, next up, we have illustrator Franz Anthony. All right. Hello and good evening, everyone, or morning, if you live in my part of the world. This is, okay. Okay, my screen shared. So my name is Franz and I do paleo art. And if, you, if you're new to anything paleontology, uh, paleo art is basically a branch of art or illustration where we try to recreate what life would have looked like in the past. So uh, I think I, uh, I was in and out during Maricela's talk, but I saw that she showed a lot of really cool fossils. But you know that fossils are basically rocks. So if you, if you want to figure out what the animals look like in life and present them to the general public, you need someone like an artist to re recreate that kind of life, to make it more presentable, to make the people understand uh, what the animal looked like and how they behaved. So uh, when I talk about belly art, most people would uh, think about dinosaurs because of course they're really iconic. They're amazing, so no doubt about it. Uh, there, there's a lot more than dinosaurs in belly art and paleontology in general. Like uh, Marisela talked about earlier, life has been around for, well, complex life has been around for 500 something million years. So there's been a lot of things that lived and died a while ago. So for example, like the mammals that Nick and Maricela loved. Uh, but I personally don't specialize in dinosaurs or mammals. So I borrowed these images from my friend, Julio. Uh, you need to follow him if you're into dinosaurs and mammals. He's really amazing. Uh, you just look up his name. So I personally prefer to specialize in invertebrates because I feel like there's a lot of animals that uh, people don't pay attention to, like this crab, for example. Uh, people don't think of crabs as, as being ancient creatures, but uh, just, just so you know, crabs have been around since the Jurassic period, at least. So the oldest crab is older than the Rex. And there are also uh, things that more people are probably more or less familiar about. Um, these are trilobites, which are mostly found as like black or maybe brown rocks. And it is an artist's job to recreate the, as, these animals so that people could probably guess what they look like in life. And there are also things that don't resemble any living things that we see today, like this worm, for example. But today, um, I'll mostly be talking about cephalopods because apparently that's what people love. Okay, so let's say you found a fossil ammonite. Uh, I saw that Maricela shared some ammonite photos earlier. There are actually so many different species of ammonites that come in different shapes. Uh, but since it's a little bit too much for this talk, so I'm just gonna simplify and call everything the ammonite because I don't have much time. So if you, Let's say you have an, an ammonite. How do you think would, the animal would look like in life? There are a few things to consider when you try to recreate uh, an animal's life appearance. The first one is uh, what the animals are related to. You know, you, you need to figure out what its closest living relatives are. And since uh, most people are probably not familiar with cephalopods because they live in, in the oceans, I'm gonna give you uh, an example that most people are probably going to be more familiar with. This cat, for example. Um, you probably have one at home, so you know what a cat looks like in real life. But if you found the bones of this cat, for example, you probably wouldn't think right away that it's a cat. But if you look closer, for example, if you look at uh, the face, maybe the fangs, the body shape, the tail, you could probably tell that it's some kind of a cat uh, but you don't know what it would look like in life. So this is where we need to look at uh, the relationships between animals. 
artists uh, and paleontologists in general use a technique called phylogenetic bracketing. So phylogeny is a study that focuses on, well, to put it simply, it's basically about the making of the tree of life. It's figuring out where things sit in the tree of life. And by bracketing, it means uh, we're looking at brackets uh, of things that are related together. For example, we know that the animal earlier was a cat. So its living appearance would have probably looked like something in this area, in this bracket, and not like something like a, an elephant, for example. So if, if you want to draw an extinct cat, you would probably think it's probably somewhere in the yellow, orange uh, color range, or maybe it's going to be stripy black, something like that. But it wouldn't be a bright green like a peacock is, or maybe a pink purple like a not like an octopus. Well, because we don't see any living uh, cats or maybe even mammals in general do they they are green. Another good example that I put here is the elephant. If you um, found the skull of an elephant or an elephant relative, like the mastodon, for example, you wouldn't be able to see the trunk or the ears. You would just see a big skull with a big hole in the front. But since it, you know that it's re, it, uh, the bones closely resemble what you see today with, in living elephants, you know that it's going to be a creature that had a long trunk and tusks, and definitely it would have a bigger ears than most other mammals. So that's what phylogenetic bracketing is. So using this principle, my friend Julio reconstructed some fossil cats. And you can see on the left here that fossil cats are, well, probably somewhere in the brown gray range. And you could see uh, it could probably be stripy, dotted, mottled, something like that. And you wouldn't even, uh, these are cats that could possibly live today and you wouldn't even think that, oh, it's something weird because it's really possible. It might not be what the animal actually look like in life, but it's, uh, it's possible that they look like this. And this is the exact cat that we saw earlier as bones. So my Julio reconstructed this cat as a gray cat with some stripes on the legs and so on. So there's another thing that we need to consider. Uh, the second one is that just because something looks similar, it doesn't mean that they are actually related. So let's say you and someone else are wearing the same clothes and the same hairstyle. It doesn't mean that you are siblings or even family because there are things that can easily change more than other things. So you could probably, if you're trying to identify people's family relationships, you would probably look at things like their bone structure, uh, their height maybe, or maybe their uh, skin color because it could uh, indicate their relationships better than something like their ha hairstyle and so on. So another, this is an extreme example, but the funny thing that has been floating around the internet is, let's say you consider a coconut. You know that a coconut is hairy and milky on the inside. But would that make a coconut a mammal? Like a cat? It's brown, sure, it's hairy and it's milky. But if you look at uh, things in general context, you know that a coconut comes from a tree and cats from, uh, came from kittens. So no, they are not actually related. So using this principle, uh, we could roughly guess what our friend, the ammonite here, would have possibly looked like in life. So just as, just as a reminder, first we need to figure out the family ties, but we also need to remember that looks may, may deceive you. So things that are, look similar may not actually be related. So this is the fam family tree of the cephalopods. As you can see here, uh, 
people are probably going to be most familiar with the octopus and the squid. But there's also the uh, Nautilus that is probably pretty iconic because it looks ancient and it it's the only true shell cephalopod that lives today. But there's also the Argonaut that most people are not really familiar with. Its uh, other name is the Paper Nautilus, and it looks shell. But if you look closer, it's not really it's not actually related to the Nautilus because uh, deep inside. It is actually just an octopus with a, with a shell that it can detach. But if you try to detach a nautilus shell, it's going to die because it's the body is anchored to the shell uh, closer to something like a snail, for example. It's just so anchored. You, it, the time, by the time you try to de detach it, it's going to die. But the Argonaut is basically just an octopus with a shell. And um, I'm not going to go too deep into the science, but uh, the ammonites are, uh, despite their hard shell, are not actually related to the nautilus. But they are, um, based on the internal anatomy of the ammonites, they're actually more closely related to the squishier part of the cephalopod tree. So using this uh, knowledge, we could probably compare uh, the features that this our squishy cephalopods have, so we can probably figure out what kind of a body shape the, ammon the ammonites would look like. So, for example, these are uh, the most commonly seen body shapes of cephalopods today, we see today. And we see that um, the octopus, like its name suggests, has eight arms. What people usually call tentacles are technically called arms. It's mostly to distinguish uh, its appendages from what people call tentacles in a uh, squid. So basically, arms is the thicker ones, the main ones, and tentacles are in squid and uh, cuttlefish, they're usually longer, and they might or might not have clubs in the end. Uh, but the Nautilus has many, many tentacles little tentacles. Uh, it, could, it could range any, uh, between 60 to 90, I believe. So it's a really big difference from 8, 10, and then 60 to 90, because it shows how actually distantly related they are. And the last thing about Nautilus is that it has this really, really cool hood, this one here. So, if we apply that knowledge to our friend, the ammonite, we could say that uh, the ammonite, since it's more closely related to the squid and the octopus, it's more, uh, it's more likely that it would have uh, 10 arms, because apparently a lot of extinct cephalopods have 10 arms, and it seems like the octopus just reduced their uh, arm count later on. And the ammonite is not likely to have the cool hood that uh, the nautilus have. So now that we know what the body looked like in life, we could start uh, talking about the coloration. The problem is, as I said earlier, the nautilus is uh, the only true shell cephalopod that lives today. So we don't really have anything to compare the ammonites with. But if we look at the tree of life in the bigger scale, we can see that uh, cephalopods are closely related to uh, the gastropods, which are snails, and also uh, bifalls, clams, and so on. And you can see here that um, snails can be can have uh, thick stripes like these ones. But they could have. Um, as you can see here and here, they, they, their stripes can go both ways. It could be like horizontal or vertical. It, uh, it could also be mottled like this. So there's a lot of possibility because um, if you look at the chemical structure of a snail shell and a cephalopod shell, it's roughly more or less the same. So we could still bracket them together and apply this kind of coloration to our ammonite friend. Another example is that 
um, these are conus shell, also known, also known as, as cone shells. They are highly venomous. But if you look at cone, sh cone shells, they are actually really diverse. You can see on the left, there's one that is uh, more or less pure white with some subtle streaks in the middle. It doesn't really show here, but in real life, it's a little bit purplish. And you can also see there are also shells with tri triangular patterns like the one in the second one here. And there are also uh, shells with kind of random patterns or maybe dots. And these are all shells that belong to the genus Conus. So um, even within closely related species, there's still a lot of variety that you can probably play with if you're an artist. So let's try to color these ammonites. I do not have much time here, so I cheated a little bit last night some, by putting some basic colors. So we could try to do a little bit of painting. Let's see how far I can go with this. But I think in the meantime, if Lynn want to join me uh, and start asking questions or whatever, it could be fine. Hi, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, this is great. And I think Lynn and I are both cracking up during your is a coconut a cat thing. <laughs> it, like, that's such, I mean. It, it kind of makes sense. Us. Yeah, <laughs> furry outside milky. Inside. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just does kind of go to show like how we obviously know what those two things are. So it's like, what yep. a silly question. But when you don't know, when you're dealing with stuff that's, you know, millions and millions of years old, you, yep. you're not familiar. So that that helped me understand what you're yeah, talking it, about. It, it is kind of extreme, but uh, yeah. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm just I'm just gonna be here hanging out. Um, if any of you watching have questions, um, I'll see them right away. So um, you can go for it. But yeah, and if you want, I think. wouldn't be able to see the chat. So Lynn is probably gonna be able to see the questions better. Yeah, yeah, we'll be able to see them. Um, but this is such a specific type of illustration. I'm wondering just like how you got into it and how steep a learning curve it is. Um, so I, I actually have been drawing animals since I was a kid. So I pretty much knew uh, the general shapes of animals. Uh, but I only started doing this seriously maybe very seriously, maybe five years ago or so. Uh, but I've been reading animal books, so I kind of know the technical terms here and there, mm -hmm. which is kind of my saving grace. <laughs> because um, biology is kind of hard to get into if you're not uh, an expert, because mm -hmm. there are a lot of technical terms. Like, for example, what uh, the thing that people used to tell that ammonites are actually not closely related to the nautilus is something like, uh, it's called the radula. Okay. It's something closer to like the thumb in our body, but it's somewhere inside, uh, somewhere inside the mouth area, somewhere in here. So it's, when I read technical papers, I have to read those words and I have to figure out what, what those words mean. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's quite a steep learning curve. Learning curve. Um, there's a question, which is, what kind of fossils do you look at to draw worms since they're so squishy? <laughs> right. I think Maricela said earlier that uh, some fossils, uh, some things fossilize better than others mm -hmm. because squishy things, well, they usually decompose pretty quickly. They rot or maybe they get eaten by other things like crabs and so on. But there are actually really good fossils um, of squishier things like the, the worms. It actually depends on uh, the site where the fossil is found because there are uh, fossil sites where really, really good fossils of squishier things are preserved with 
in such high details you can actually see uh, the filaments uh, the hairy parts of the body yeah. so there are there are fossils out there awesome oh and what are you using to draw right now oh i'm using photoshop which is my main thing <laughs> are you using um a tablet or yeah i'm using a tablet cool um oh this is this is interesting um because you're talking about yeah working with scientific papers and learning how to read those um, and when you're doing uh, work, somebody asks, how much feedback do scientists give? Um, do you ever feel a tug of war between scientific interpretations? Right. Um, it actually depends on the artist, really, uh, because I personally don't consider myself as a scientist. So I usually defer to the scientist and I kind of follow their advice pretty closely. But there are some artists who are also scientists and they might have their own opinion about things and they might be correct, of course, because they actually handle fossils and so on. But since my background is actually graphic design and illustration, so I, I prefer not to comment too much on the accuracy and so on because I, it's, not my, it's not my expertise and I know it. Yeah, yeah. Um... Oh, this is good. This is this is related to um, trying to draw worms from. Well, you, you were saying that they they were they're fossils, but when you just see kind of a flattened fossil, how do you fill out its three D shape? How do you figure out how it would look in three dimensions? Um, uh, yeah, it's mostly about finding the right fossils, really, because um, when you look at Trilobites, for example. Tri trilobites are pretty common in North America, I believe, right? Cockroaches um, of the ocean. Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, and that uh, some fossils are more common than others. And let's see, if you have a lot of uh, little dead things, some of them are going to be dead, not in the same position, right? So it's a matter of finding fossils that look maybe are lying down side or something like that, that shows you a different side of the, of the body. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, I also work with fossil crabs and mm -hmm. you can't really tell what they look like under, underneath unless you found a fossil that, sh uh, that is flipped upside down or maybe uh, the fossil is kind of sandwiched. The, the animal is kind of sandwiched between plates so you can actually rip it open and see both sides of the crab, but otherwise, Sometimes you only see uh, one part of it. And uh, sometimes there are just animals that you can't really reconstruct because you don't know much about it. You just have to give up. Yeah. Um, I was, yeah, I was interested in when you were talking about, you were showing off Julio's art and about the different cat, like the different fur, like sometimes he depicts it as striped or spotted and right now you're you're doing a kind of um orangish um yep. so like how i know i know you talked a little bit color but like ultimately how do you kind of decide whether to give something stripes or spots and right what kind of pattern um so i know we talked about family relationships earlier mm -hmm. and we know that a cat for example is not likely to have like false eyes like on the tail of a pickup or a moth, mm -hmm. for example. But uh, so we know that it's more likely to be uh, spotted or maybe stripy, but there are also things that, um, uh, there are actually tied to their behavior, for example. Like if you look at fish, uh, fish that live in the open ocean, like maybe tuna or maybe even not fish, something like a dolphin, for example, it's gonna be more more or less grayish or bluish because it's trying to blend in with its surrounding. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you compare that to fish that live in the coral reefs, for example, uh, the coral reefs if, is really vibrant and colorful. So a fish who lives there can be colorful and still go undetected by predators. So um, there's a lot of ecology that plays out when I look at, uh, when I decide colors. But also sometimes there are fossils that you 
don't even know where it was found. It was just one fossil. You don't know what kind of other animals live in it. So let's say you found a fish and you found a fossil anemone next to it. So you know it's probably going to live somewhere in the coral reef, maybe. But if you found uh, a fish that is just there alone, you can't really tell where it lives. So you kind of just, sometimes you just have to decide what looks attractive to the viewers, but also you have to make it more or less reasonable. Yeah, no, no polka dotted. Uh, yeah, no animates. polka dotted. Yeah, like, Is anything polka dotted? I guess there are shells uh, that are polka dotted. Yeah, actually, <laughs> it's funny because um, different animals seem to have different uh, color patterns. Maybe it, I believe it's something, it's tied to their chemical structure or something like that. Um, but you know, we see that maybe shells or even fish can be polka dot or maybe it, some fish can have really, really complex uh, patterns, mm -hmm. but mammals don't usually have them. But also it's because mammals are mostly more or less colorblind because I believe mammals evolve at night when dinosaurs roam the day. So mammals are usually a little bit more crap compared to like invertebrates or birds. Hmm. Um, there's been a lot of mentions of Animal Crossing in the comments. Ooh. Are you getting yeah. are, <laughs> lots of people asking, do you collect fossils in Animal Crossing? And what do you think of their animations? Little critique. Yeah. Let's hear it. Oh my, I'm, <laughs> I'm a heavy Animal Crossing player. And okay. if you look at my play time, it's just astronomical. Um, but yeah, um, I think it's pretty well done for a mainstream game that is not really focused on paleontology because um, a lot of uh, the depictions are pretty up to date, even though there's a funny thing that happened a while ago is that uh, Spin uh, Spinosaurus just got a new tail. There's Ooh. a new tail of the body, uh, a new fossil tail was found a while ago and it, it happened just after the game's launch. So uh, the game, the fossil in the game was technically inaccurate just weeks after it launched because a new fossil came out. So the tail, when, uh, when we think of Spinosaurus, Sorry, I don't draw the dinosaurs often, but <laughs> so the head is shaped like crocodile like this. Uh -huh. And we see it has like bump on the back, spine on the back, and the tail. Most people would depict it something like this, but I believe uh, the new tail was something more like a fish, something like this. But I forgot huh. the details. Of this. Yeah, it's pretty new. It just came out this year. It's pretty funny. The, uh, the, to watch people talk about it online. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was actually fun. Like a while ago, we did a little Instagram story, story series with Maricela um, and she was talking about, she showed us fossils from the Academy's collection that um, Pokemon were inspired Ooh. by. Yeah. And so like that was like, she showed the Pokemon next to the fossils. And I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's really nice. A, yeah, they're paying a lot of attention. So yeah, that's one way to get people attention. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's why paleo art is really important, in my opinion, because it shapes. Um, uh, we know that uh, scientists talk to each other a lot in like conferences and and so on. But a lot a lot of that information don't really actually make it to the public. So um, pop culture mm -hmm. and art in general, like this, is what actually shapes the public's opinion and what they uh, think animals look like. So that's actually our job to make it look, to make animals look uh, presentable, but also, I guess, reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think to just spark people's interest in science yeah. too, with something, I mean, like this, this looks amazing after what we've been, you've been coloring for 10 minutes. Um, yeah, because I, uh, what usually takes longest for me is mm -hmm. deciding what color I want to use. Okay. So I kind of cheated a little bit last night and just picked some color already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is it is it kind of close to close to finished now, or what would you? What else yeah, would we, you? We could probably call it finished because 
Otherwise, I would keep tweaking this for a whole day. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody asked, and this is always just a fun question, like, what's your very favorite animal to draw? I know you like the Nautilus mm -hmm. with its cool hood, but what else? <laughs> that is a difficult question. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've been drawing a lot of crabs lately. Okay. Mostly because uh, people don't think about uh, crustaceans a lot, but they actually have a lot of funny little parts. Like their body shapes can be, you know that the crabs we see on a daily basis are more like the emoji crabs, right? <laughs> but there are also crabs that look like Dorito. The body is just a triangle and uh, it had like tiny arms on the side. And there are also crabs with um, a really, really long elbows. So it looks, oh, so it looks <laughs> something closer. Let's say this is the body. So the claws are like this. So it's the crab is mostly oh, elbows. Wow. <laughs> it's not something that uh, most people would think about when they uh, when they say crabs because they're really diverse and kind of underappreciated i think nice is it a chip or a crab how will we ever know uh <laughs> crabs and chips i guess <laughs> um yeah well thank you so much this was really interesting and and fun to see like no this, this, this creature come um, to life. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, and I would like to thank my friend Julio for lending me his mages. You can follow him on his social media here. I showed uh, the links on the screen. And if you would like to uh, read more about the history of cephalopods, uh, they, cephalopods have been around for over 400 million years, so they have a much longer history than dinosaurs. So I recommend you to read uh, Dennis Staff's um, Monarchs of the Sea. And if you want to read more about their behavior and so on, there's a book called Other Minds. That's really, really good. I just finished it. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, check out all those links. And um, I'm going to say goodbye to Franz and bring Lynn back on the screen. Thank you. Bye. Hi. I love the Dorito crab. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in tonight and a special thanks to Maricela, Nick and Franz. Next week, it's our Halloween special. Um, get ready for a night of science, death and drag. We're talking alligator carcasses and zombie worms, jumping spiders, spooky tales from a blackwater photographer and new alternative burials. We'll also have Asian American drag troupe rice rockets who will take over hosting duties with some terrifyingly entertaining performances. And um, in case you haven't heard already, the Academy is actually reopening to the public tomorrow. Um, this has been seven, seven months. Um, and we just wanted to thank you so much to all the people who are tuning in for the first time, for the members, the donors for, for, for supporting us all this time. We're so, we wouldn't, be getting to tomorrow without you. Um, nightlife is not returning just yet, but we will definitely let you know as soon as we do. We're eager to see you. Um, until then, thank you so much and have a good night. Good night.